Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be today talking about current role of airway blocks. Uh, my name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh. I'm a consultant in anesthesia at the Royal Liverpool University of Hospitals. So first question is obviously is why airway blocks? Why do we need to know about them? All of us in our life will face patients who need anesthesia. And these patients have airway compromise or trauma to the upper way, unstable uh, cervical spine. And in these cases, we need to secure the airway awake. And to secure airway awake, we need to know about airway blocks. Okay, so that's where uh, my talks comes in. So airway blocks may be required for having an awake look. So this is, we're talking about awake uh, video laryngoscopy or it may be required for awake fiber optic intubation, which could be oral intubation or it could be nasal intubation. So when we are talk about the airway blocks, we talk about the innervation of the airway. And if we are going to do a nasal intubation, uh, the tube need to pass through the nose, to the nares, uh, oropharyngeal area, and then into the trachea. So for the nasal, Area, that's the they're supplied by the trigeminal nerve, oropharyngeal area supplied by glossopharyngeal nerve, and the vagus supplies the trachea part of it. If you are actually planning to do a oral intubation, then uh, you could avoid uh, blocking the trigeminal nerve. So the three nerves that are three main areas that need to be blocked is the trigeminal area, uh, glossopharyngeal area, and the vagus area. If you look at the trigeminal nerve, all three divisions are actually involved. So we have antirhythmodal nerves, which are branches of the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve, uh, spilopanodon nerves coming from the maxillary division, and the lingual nerve, which is part of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerves. We don't uh, bother about much about the lingual nerve. Then we have the glossopharyngeal nerve, as we talked about it. And the vagus nerve, uh, we have the superior laryngeal and uh, it's branched the internal laryngeal and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So when we look at awake uh, video laryngoscopy or oral uh, awake fiber optic intubation, in that case, uh, we are going through the oropharyngeal route uh, to the trachea. So we need to block the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve. But if you're looking at the nasal uh, awake fibrotic intubation, in that case, you need to block the uh, trigeminal nerve branches and the vagus. If you want to block the oropharyngeal area, then you can actually, but you can avoid it. It's not really necessary uh, unless you are going to have someone pull the tongue. That is actually required uh, when you are going to do a sedated or uh, patients who are mildly sedated. and. Uh, uh, you want to do that where the tongue is falling back. So first we look at the trigeminal nerve, how we're going to block. Like I said, lingual is not important. What's important is to uh, block the antirhythmoidal nerves and the spinopalatine ganglia and the nerves. So we can actually use a cotton taped applicator uh, that is soaked in lignocaine. And uh, for ethmoidal, you need to go on the, uh, you know, uh, anteriorly, uh, through the nose, uh, almost parallel to the to the nose, uh, the opening, and uh, you apply the anterior model uh, and the anterior part just near the uh, you know cribriform plate. Uh, for the sphenopalatine ganglia, you need to go almost uh, uh, parallel uh, to your maxilla, and uh, it uh, goes in the middle turbinate, just posterior part of the middle turbinate. And uh, you, again, uh, have the lignocaine uh, soaked, uh, the cotton applicator, and uh, you can actually apply uh, two of them uh, in that area if that is, uh, because that is that is very important for the uh, anesthetizing the airway, nasal, nasal pharyngeal airway. You could also use atomizers, uh, uh, Devil bliss atomizers, and uh, this can also be modified. So instead of actually having the manual pump, 
uh, you could also use uh, oxygen uh, tubing. You need to actually have a hole. So where you see the right hand, uh, that's actually got a hole in it. So you can then control uh, the atomization. We also have uh, the commercially available uh, applicators or the atomizers uh, that can be arranged to syringe. I'll talk about them in a minute. We also have uh, the sprays. Now, this one is uh, the one which I use. Uh, we have a lidocaine uh, uh, with phenylephrine spray. Phenylephrine is a vasoconstrictor. So instead of actually applying vasoconstrictors separately, uh, you can use this uh, combination and uh, this will anesthetize uh, the nasopharyngeal airway and also cause basic constriction, so increase the space uh, for passing the tube in. Liquid cane on its own is also available. This is uh, available as 10 milligram per spray, so you can actually uh, you know, calculate your dose very easily. The other thing I use is, uh, you know, lignocaine uh, gel uh, that is applied to a nasopharyngeal airway. And it also helps you to, you know, uh, gauze the size of the, uh, you know, what kind of size of tube you could be able to pass through the nasopharyngeal, to the nares. And uh, because it's important that you do not cause much trauma. And uh, so you can anesthetize as well as you can then also know what size tube could easily pass. Uh, through the nose. You need to be careful with the dose of lidocaine used, and uh, we need to not exceed the dose more than nine milligram per kg lean body weight. Not the total body weight, but the lean body weight is important here. So blocking the glossopharyngeal nerve. Glossopharyngeal nerve can be uh, blocked uh, using just a spray and uh, that's uh, the easy way but you can also block it by doing injections you need to be careful when you're using injection intraoral root injection because the carotid artery is just running behind it uh, so there are very high risk of causing intravascular injections when using the technique okay. as you can see that it's easy to actually see the tonsillar pillars and uh, you need to actually just go anteriorly to the anterior tonsil pillar, uh, inject local anesthetic there, it'll spread to the glossopharyngeal nerve. And like I said, you can easily do it with just spraying uh, with uh, some lignocaine. You can also do an extra oral injection. Uh, you need to find the midpoint of the mastoid and the uh, mandibular angle, uh, hit the starlight process and walk off it and you will be onto the glossopharyngeal nerve. Again, remember the internal carotid artery is running very, very close by. Uh, so always aspirate and inject uh, before uh, you try to block anything. When you're talking about anesthetizing the oropharyngeal airway, we always talk about whether we should be using anti antisalagogues or not. And uh, it is said that uh, it's important to actually have a diamucosa for the local anesthetic to be uh, you know, effective because the saliva will dilute it. So most people do actually use antisalagogues, though we don't uh, normally uh, use it because we tend to actually do nasal intubation mostly. But if you are going to use uh, glycoparolate, then use 200 uh, micrograms, 200 to 400 micrograms. And if you're using IM, then use it 40 to 60 minutes before uh, you get the patient to the theater. If you're going to use it IV, uh, then give 100, 200 micrograms. And with that, be careful because that is going to cause undesirable clinical consequences. If you're talking about that is tachycardia. It will cause tachycardia, irrespective. Even though it is antisalagal dose, it will cause tachycardia. So the last part is the vagus nerve, and there are lots written about it. Uh, how do you block the superior laryngeal nerve? or the internal laryngeal branch of it and the recurrent laryngeal branch. How are you going to do? Uh, so that is Jackson Krauss forceps. So you, this is used for application of a, a cotton pledget uh, soaked with uh, lidocaine. And this is then uh, you know, kept in the pyriform forceps on both sides and that can uh, you know, block the internal laryngeal nerve. 
or you could actually talk about doing uh, blocks and uh, there are two techniques in which in some people would actually go and hit the greater corner of the hired and just walk off it or they would go one centimeter medially and four to five centimeter below uh, quarterly and then pierce the thyrohyoid membrane and inject a local anesthetic to it. So there is again different techniques in which you hold the uh, thyroid bone if you can actually feel it and push it towards your thumb. Okay, that I'll show you in another image that it is. So you actually, so with your left hand, you hold a hyoid bone and push it uh, from the, your left side to the right side towards the thumb, uh, hit the uh, greater corner of the hyoid bone and then walk off it and inject local anesthetic to, pro, uh, to uh, block the superior angel nerve. Or you could just uh, block, like I said, go one centimeter medially and four to five centimeter cordard. And <clears throat> then you pierce the uh, thyroid membrane and inject local anesthetic, piercing the uh, you know, thyroid membrane that will block just the internal laryngeal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. To block the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, you can actually use a uh, transtracheal or tra go an injection through the cracothyroid uh, membrane and inject local anesthetic into the trachea directly. So transtracheal uh, injection through the cracothyroid membrane. Uh, uh, deposit local anesthetic, let the patient cough, that will likely spread uh, the local anesthetic in and out uh, or anesthetize the uh, You can also, if you are actually used to doing the uh, ultrasound, you can do ultrasound guided block as well. You can actually, uh, you know, uh, trace the uh, thyroid cartilage, which is easy to see and uh, uh, follow it up to the higher bone. Uh, you can not see it directly, but you can actually see the, uh, you know, the vascular, the neurovascular bundle can be seen. You can hit the, the cone and uh, just walk off it. So you can actually do a block uh, using ultrasound as well. As some people actually say, why actually do all these kind of blocks, you know, poking needle here and there, why not just nebulize? So we'll take lignocaine, um, doesn't matter 5%, 10% lignocaine. 10% lignocaine is always in the CD cupboard. It's not uh, freely available. And uh, nebulize it. Give them time, 20 minutes or so, and uh, patient will breathe through the nose. It will anesthetize. It will anesthetize in the nasopharyngeal airway, the oropharyngeal airway, and the trachea. So do that. That's one way of doing it. So lignocaine nebulization is this. The most common method of uh, doing the anesthesia for the airway is by topicalization of spray as you go. Uh, there are commercially available uh, devices like ENK device uh, for that, but most of us would actually just uh, use an epidural catheter and uh, attach a syringe. So in this case, we take around three or four syringes and we load it with 2% lignocaine and uh, so two mLs of lidocaine and uh, three mLs of air. So you need to have that air to push uh, the lignocaine and, uh, you know, uh, then it will uh, spray itself. So this is a look at it. So that's uh, epidural catheter uh, with the uh, lignocaine through that. Like I said, there are commercially available atomizers uh, available. You can have a bottle form, uh, metamizers. And uh, so this uh, can be attached to uh, lignocaine or you can uh, pour lignocaine into and atomize it. Uh, there are syringe uh, with uh, the atomizer, which can be uh, uh, attached to it, it's conical, it fits into the nares easily and you can calculate the amount of dose uh, delivered as well. So they're well, pretty accurate. Or they can have an atomizer stillet, malleable stillet, so you can actually steer it. So you can steer it through the nose or through the oropharyngeal airway. And again, it is attached to a syringe, so you know how much amount you are actually delivering. <coughs> Sorry. Then there are airways uh, they, that comes, uh, this is the oropharyngeal airway that comes uh, attached uh, with a atomizer as well as uh, oxygen. So you can attach the oxygen. So one of them you as the atomizer uh, with lignocaine and the other can be attached to the oxygen tubing. So you can deliver oxygen as well as uh, the deliver uh, the local anesthetic. Now, as far as uh, the literature is concerned about uh, you know, evidence of the blocks versus uh, the other techniques. There isn't much. 
uh, but uh, there are a few uh, commonly quoted uh, you know articles which talk about the difference uh, between blocks and uh, in topicalization and they say the blocks of the glossopharyngeal and superior laryngeal nerves uh, are associated with higher plasma concentration of local anesthetic so there is a greater absorption uh, there is chance of local anesthetic toxicity. As I've said, uh, your glossopharyngeal nerve lies very close to the carotid artery injection on there. And obviously there are going to be multiple injection into blocks bilaterally. So you're going to give glossopharyngeal and you know, the other nerve blocks, superior laryngeal blocks. You need to do them both sides. So multiple blocks, multiple needle, needle punctures are uh, required. So what do our guidelines actually say about them? And so the ASA uh, guidelines don't uh, mention. So there are practice guidelines for management of difficult airway. And uh, they actually talk about, you know, you need awake intubation in patients uh, who have difficult airway. Uh, but they don't talk about uh, how it need to be done. Okay. So technique we need to use for awake tracheal intubation. That's not, that's left to the anesthetist to decide. Uh, what about the Difficult Airway Society? Difficult Airway Society came out with guidelines very, very recently, uh, just last year, early last year, and they were published. And they do actually talk about it. So if you look at it, uh, they talk about oxygenation, topicalization, sedation, and performance. So it's important to keep oxygenation. <clears throat> you can use sedation. Okay, and then you, but we are not interested. I'm not talking about other aspects, which will be uh, you know, covered by other map, other faculty. I'm talking about topicalization. So they do talk about topicalization and they say that uh, you can use 10% spray, which I was talking about 10 milligram per spray on the tonsillar pillars on the base of the tongue. And you can use around 20 to 30 sprays during inspiration of five minutes. For the nose, uh, you can use co-phenylacane, that is the lidocaine with phenylephrine, that is 5% lidocaine uh, with phenylephrine, so it would cause vasoconstriction as well. And you can always repeat them, and you can also actually use it along with co as you spray. Uh, you need to actually have, uh, you know, uh, spray, like I said, you have 5 ml syringes filled with 2% uh, lidocaine and uh, each is filled with 2 ml of uh, the lidocaine and 3 ml of air which can be delivered uh, through an epidural catheter. Or you can use if you have a MAD device then you can actually use that for that. And it's important like how to calculate the maximum dose. I'm not going to go through this. And like I've said, it need to be a uh, maximum need to be nine milligram per kg. Uh, of the lean body weight, not the total body weight, but the lean body weight is the maximum dose used. To end this talk and the summary of that, we need to actually have knowledge of the innervation of the upper airways. Uh, we know that need comes to, comes from the trigeminal nerves, uh, from the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve branches or the vagus nerve. You need to have the knowledge of appropriate local anesthetic techniques and vasoconstrictor drugs. So if you're using the nasal airway, uh, use uh, topical uh, you know, vasoconstrictors. Uh, Lidocaine with phenylephrine is a good uh, you know, drug to use. And then you need to actually have an idea about the various techniques available. Uh, you can use nebulization, you can use nerve blocks. You can use combination of it. It does not have to be just, you know, uh, one or the other, you can actually use. So you can use trans uh, tracheal injection through the cricothyroid membrane um, to reduce the coughing, and as well as uh, spray as you go. Or you can use uh, the nebulization technique with. So you can use. So just be careful that you do not exceed uh, the total amount of lidocaine used because the chances of uh, local anesthetic toxicity are high. And always have uh, intralipid in the theater, operation theater, in case you land up in trouble. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you all. Have a nice day.